Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the new year, um, 2015, January 7th. Um, and we are, um, you know, I was just saying, we're kind of rusty getting back into the game here. Um, I think, <laughs> thanks, Karen. I think, um, I think uh, <laughs> that's, that's new, isn't it? I mean, it's not brand new, but yeah. Uh, we're sending each other notes here. Um, hi, I'm Paul Ellison, and uh, Chris Rogers and Chris Sloan and Karen Fastenpower are with us so far, and a few other people I think are going to join us. I think Sam is going to join us. I think Al is going to join us. But um, if you're hearing this and you want to join us, it would be a great time to join us. Um, we are leaving some space to continue talking to move the race conversation forward is what I'd like to say tonight and um, uh, so let's see where that goes. Um, Dan Dornberg from um, Now Comment is also joining us I hope because I've been uh, kind of building some curriculum around Now Comment again and he's been like wait a second you got all that stuff up there and nobody's annotating it yet. Um, anyway so <laughs> but anyway he has some ideas too maybe he'll join us but we'll see where this goes. However, Chris, you are Chris Rogers. You are um, our guest tonight, let's put it that way. I've been teasing you that way. Um, because you've pointed us to Race Forward. Um, do you want to kind of introduce yourself and then introduce the concept and we'll play with it a little bit? I'm glad to have so much yeah. time to talk to you about it. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, I'm uh, Chris Rogers, uh, educator in Philadelphia, local independent school. Uh, library and technology, and um, I came to this uh, race forward piece through uh, Jay Smooth, who's a, a radio host at. Let me see if I can get this right. WBLS is that a radio station in New York, Paul? It sure is. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a radio host over at WBLS. He does a um, hip hop show on the weekends, but also like very critical and um, ran like a great video blog site, Ill Doctrine. So he did a video for this race forward piece, and what I loved about it was its connection between the individual, um, the levels of racism. You know, at, at the time, Meek Mill had a big song, this levels to this. So they talk about, like, levels to racism. And um, they moving from, like, the internalized racism to interpersonal racism to systemic racism to structural. And kind of, like, to break each one of those down, internalized is more um, about racism within or... Um, so sort of like inside and like maybe like as a black person how I feel about black people knowing that myself is black. Uh, interpersonal gets to more about how um, sort of like a cross and uh, between like maybe like white uh, one person like racial acts, individual acts about. Um, and then there's uh, systemic which gets more into like the policy and institutional practices that happen which lead to you know disparate impacts. Uh, on different races, um, of, and then there's structural, which takes across institutions. So maybe across institutions, a great one is like education. When you talk about poverty and how that disproportionately affects uh, black and brown people, and then you look at school funding, which is based on property taxes. So if you look at like the tax base, it's not, you know, you couldn't say that anything of that is, well, I would say it's definitely racist, but be able to like have those systems talk to one another and create even more um, insidious level of racism, I guess you could say. So that's really why I came to it. I love it as a model to talk about, you know, connecting that, the institutional to the, um, to the, like, the individual ways racism plays out and also connecting the individual ways race plays out into a systemic way. So I always come back to it. Mm -hmm. Well, their research report came out last year, about a year ago, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. I looked at the date. Um, what, I mean, what, do you remember we were talking about Black Lives Matter, we were talking about responsibility, I think, um, mm -hmm. like who's to blame for, you know, racist acts? Is that, I mean, what made you think, wow, we need this model, this, in our, and I w want to break down the word model a little bit, but what what made you think that this framework will help us 
move our conversation forward and move the conversation around you know what's going on with with police brutality for you um I think the the big thing oh yeah, I, someone else about to say something no. um but the big thing for me the big thing for me is that I think people feel that like being racist is like a very heavy idea, and for me it's just like plain it's like waking up in the morning. Um, it's like we are we all take part we are we all take part in a system which creates um, a disproportionate like which creates inequity and that inequity is spread disproportionately to black and brown people um, that is racist um, yeah, so I think for me when I talk about moving a race conversation forward there's a um, always there's a level of um, Discomfort with being thought of as racist, being thought of as yeah, I being able to say I benefit from racism. And what I like about this race forward and moving the race conversation forward is it makes that plain that we are all um, at, on some varying levels um, because of power dynamics within spaces. We are all guilty in in some sense. We are all we all take part within the system. We all um, have a, uh, especially in the American ideal, we all um, are part of a system of white supremacy, and we benefit from that. Even being in America today, even as a, a black American, the idea of American, you know, still puts me in a, a level of guilt. Um, so, like, taking responsibility for that, and once we, feel, once we start to take responsibility from that, that's when we start to move forward. Mm -hmm. And just a, you're hoping to put together a conference or a workshop or something that helps us look at, helps the teachers you're working with, I don't know who you're hoping to do this with, um, looks at making this part of a curriculum in some way? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a, there's a um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to put it in the chat once I sort of get a second. It's the Institute uh, inst the Teachers of Color Committed to Racial Justice Institute that takes place at San Jose State in California, or it did last year. And uh, me and my friend from Virginia, she was on a call a couple weeks ago, Janae, we were saying, like, wow, that is awesome, but it takes place in Virginia. <laughs> I mean, not Virginia, it takes place in California. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you got to think about how do you, you know, get all the way over there. Um, like with funding and kind of convince your school to pay for like the plane ticket and everything like that. Um, so we just said, you know what? I think that we are pretty um, like we're pretty adept at sort of like the research and the um, things that are out there that really speak to like the racial justice cause. There's no reason why we can't begin to convene our own conversation. And I'm pretty sure that they over in California will really like enjoy us trying to move that work, uh, do the same effort over here on the East Coast. So we just had this idea of doing like a, a day-long racial justice institute to really talk about like the same like race, moving the race conversation forward framework and really how do we implement that as everyday practice um, so that it, it doesn't become sort of like this reactive space where, okay, this happens and then we talk about it, but how do we begin to take just okay, simple thank you history and connect it to all the, you know, institutional and systemic structural ways in which uh, race, you know, plagues America. Or racism plagues America. Mm -hmm. Sloan, do you want to jump in? Hi, how are you, by the way? <laughs> Good, happy new year. Um, so uh, when Chris shared Hi, that, uh, the, the Race Forward resource, um, you know, I, I wasn't aware of it, and um, one of the eye-openers for me was that... Um, you know, the different levels, um, the institutional level and the systemic level. And uh, it was kind of interesting because right now we're reading a book about uh, the death penalty, you know, dead man walking. And um, so it reframed the way I approached it in the classroom because um, before it was always this debate about, well, the guy did some heinous stuff and therefore he deserves it. Um, and so now we're looking more at the, or at least I'm reframing the argument of the book about, like, there's some systemic issues involved there, and, and definitely, you know, race plays out there, and poverty. 
Um, and so I think it's interesting for the, the students, too, to, to look at things from that systemic level. And I think, for me, when I first look at the Race Forward um, curriculum, you know, I wasn't sure how I could uh, implement it you know, in, in within the confines of what I was doing. And then I realized, like, it was really all around me. And um, so I liked how I that video was the first thing I watched on the site. And that, you know, is a really engaging, um, you know, like, good introduction to it. And so just in my own setting, like, it is interesting to look at this large issue, race and poverty, through the lens of this book both from the individual level and the systemic level and I think like that seems to be an area that I guess it's new for me to approach it that way but I'm interested in how the students are gonna react and kinda where they're gonna take that thinking from here so um, I was really happy that you shared that um, resource and then the the I word part of it about immigration drop the I word um, it's also really relevant to us because we're in the desert southwest and so, you know, I have a lot of uh, students of Mexican descent and, and so, um, again, looking at things from the systemic level I think is just, like, really fascinating to me and I think really promising for what we're going to do with our students. You know, just, to, just um, and Dan, welcome. We'll get to you in a second. But... Oh, thanks. One of the one of the things that I think about, given the you know Black Lives Matter conversation and the issues around this very specific cases that have come up since August and and before that and so forth, is that um, I don't like I don't want to lose the I don't think I want we want to lose I don't want to lose the the focus on the individual acts the, the what actually happened. Right, but moving, you know, so moving between the the, the the layers seems important to me. I, um, however, I like how far do we really want to teach? Like, how far was Michael Brown away from the police officer when he got shot? You know, so like, I think, I think that that you're pushing us in this direction is to kind of push the curriculum away from those kinds of details. And to something else, is that? Do you hear? I, I'm, I said both things there. I hope you know. <laughs> like I want the details, but I don't know how when to let go of them. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a um, there's there's definitely a, a need to focus on individual acts, but then in order to um, I, I think of um, especially as like in the, in the library sense, I think of it as a genealogy, right? Of how the DNA of this case is very eerily similar to the DNA of this case, which is similar to the case of this case from the 80s, like um, Amadou Diallo, the Amadou Diallo case versus Eric Garner, you know, or um, even sort of like in the imaginary, you think of like Radio Raheem from Do the Right Thing. That movie came out in like, what, 91 or 92 or so. And like just connecting all these different pieces to say that this is not a new idea. Um, and the the what's what's even what even grows the Black Lives Matter movement now is that this isn't new. It's it's a history, and being able to take these individual acts and connect them to the history is the same thing as moving from that individual level up to that systemic level of how these things take place uh, over a lot of space. So don't forget, don't get caught up in the details. One of the things that I always get worried about is. <laughs> Um, especially with um, like racism, you, you you can get caught up in the intentions of like, well, he didn't in like this was an, an intentional racist act, and I always uh, try to counter that with, it's not about the like the perpetrator's intention, but it is about the um, I guess the victims, the impact on the victim, and let's and let's talk about the impact on the victim. And kind of in, I, I want to. I wouldn't say disregard, but let's put priority on the impact of the victim rather than the attention of the uh, perpetrator. And I, I, there's something in there that I still am questioning about. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. 
Dan and Karen, do you want to jump in? Um, Karen, do you want to say something, jump in, and then we'll reintroduce Dan here to our community? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just say really quickly, I do think that looking at the bigger systemic issues and the connection and the sort of preponderance of all these situations, I think that you can get caught up in the details and just miss the big picture. And I think one of the most disturbing things to me in this whole, however, you know, particularly since the Black Lives Matter thing really has wound up, is just hearing hearing sort of casual conversations outside of school and not with kids, but just casual conversations of people who otherwise <laughs> seem like normal thinking people making comments that I'm just like blown away by that seem so racist to me. And a lot of times they start in the details or, or they're all about the details. And they're like, well, there's this situation, this situation. And it's like that, that you're missing the big picture here. So I really appreciate the sort of moving it up a notch and looking at the really big systemic issues and, and the history too. So Dan, let's let's uh, take a pause and in introduce you and say that uh, you're here tonight because, and I'll make a connection. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Doing all the hard work for me. Yeah, well, no, but Dan, Dan was checking the logs out on Now Comment, and he noticed that I was putting a lot of stuff up about Black Lives Matter and on Now Comment, and and Selma in particular, um, trying to build some curriculum around around the movie. Um, and but he wasn't seeing anybody using the stuff yet, so we're gonna have a talk about that. But um, do you want to say briefly about what Now Comment is and? Um, and then we'll kind of get into it. I mean, you are also been involved with uh, something called fairness for a while, too. So I think these issues are close to your heart, too, if that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely very interested. Um, now Comment is, is a software tool that's a disc document discussion. It's what I call it. You can call it annotation or whatever, but you have an article. You have uh, It's actually multimedia, so it could be pictures, videos, whatever. But it's a it allows a lot of people to discuss some kind of a document, and their comments are shown in context with particular sentences or paragraphs that they want to comment on. So anyway, I'm 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 kind of coming here more you know certainly not a teacher, <laughs> and I have no uh, no in the trenches experience really. But um, uh, fairness.com is a public interest group, and our uh, now comment tool was designed to help. Um, you know, s civil democracy and teachers and, you know, good applications. So I'm kind of here as a resource person tonight. And, uh, yeah, the email that I sent Paul was like, uh, wow, there's a lot, of, a lot of great stuff on the site. And I was just curious what the plan was if the, you know, if Salt Lake and Philadelphia and New York were going to be having joint conversations about some of these interesting documents. Or I, I just emailed Paul to, to kind of see, uh, where things were at. Yeah, well, cool. Welcome. Hey, Chris, are you still there, Chris Sloan? Nope. Um, <laughs> let me... Uh, he'll be, go ahead, Karen. What were you going to ask? So I have an interesting thought about document annotation related to if some of this grand jury stuff gets publicly released. And would you, like, what would be the pros and cons of, of really delving into that and doing document, doing annotation with a class? Sort of vis-a-vis -vis the conversation we had about getting into the details. And I mean, I, I guess my gut reaction is, like, nobody was there. And, and I just don't know, like, in some ways I think it serves the purpose of looking at it critically, but in other ways I think it's not really the point. So I'm curious on people's response to that. I am. Uh, I'm totally for that. Uh, I think that the the primary, the court court documents right now, are like an, a very important primary source. And just like the turning of history, even if you go back to like you know like the court documents from like Brown versus Board to like some of the, like the landmark cases of our time, and to be able to get into those historic cases and and be able to ask questions and have the ability to question Supreme Court justices is something that 
I would be amazed at, you know, the, the, um, for a student to have experienced that, to say, I don't know what Antonio Scalia was thinking here. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Or in, I'm thinking of that from the Supreme Court. But then bring that back down to, like, uh, cases such as, you know, Darren Wilson um, and um, the case of, um, I, don't, I can't remember the police officer and the uh, Eric Garner case, but being able to, like, look at those in – and question the um, – and know that you have the capacity and the um, – it, it is your right as a citizen to be able to question these documents and question the intentions and question the um, authority of the United States. That's what the Constitution was made for. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a skill if we're going to, like, really take our rights and our citizenship as it is – I think it's something that we should definitely be exploring in school, the ability to, you know, really go through the document. But going, going, going back to the uh, race forward levels, though, like what level are we on when we're looking at those details? Or is it a, a different kind of model? Well, it kind of depends how you cover it. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, on one level you could cover sort of the real details of what evidence, but then at another level... You know what Chris was just saying, it's about transparency in government and civic participation, and then that really takes it up to the level that I think you do want to be talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, when we close doors and say, oh, you know, we can't see this process, that's a systemic issue to really talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, a a big part of that report, I, I, I think it's worth remembering, is, or at least the first part, is about how the where the media is, right, and being able to assess what the media is doing with the details. And if and if I could, has anybody, I, I got to see Selma, um, anybody else get to see Selma yet? You got to go tomorrow if it's on yet, where you are. <laughs> but yeah. So, but but you know the whole debate about, the, the debate about Johnson and how he's presented is like, like that's that's on some sort of interpersonal level, and it's missing the point in big ways. So, I think it's another example of like if you get tied into those details, you you miss the the big picture in some way. But what I'm um, going with that? But yeah, but Chris, I just wanted to Dan. I wanted to ask Chris Sloan, who's back now, your question, like. Uh, Chris, have have you jumped into uh, now comment yet? Do you have a little bit with students or any thoughts yeah. about how we might do that more? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, my students, have commented on the now comment stuff, but not your newest stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, what we're gonna do with our whole senior class. Uh, at my school, so this is like about 200 kids. Um, there's a thing called Sundance Film Festival that takes place in Utah, and um, last year we uh, went down and we watched uh, Freedom Summer, which was about um, the Mississippi Voting Act, uh, the movement back in 1964, I think it was. Uh, and so it's they by were Stan- juniors at the time. Or- so Say that again. They were juniors at the time. No, we brought last year's seniors class. Oh, we always it. we get to bring our senior class to a Sundance film. Uh, it's okay. one of their educational outreach programs. So anyway, I saw uh, this movie Freedom Summer. Now this year's seniors are going to see Stanley Nelson's next one. So uh, he's on a real roll. Like to have a film at Sundance two years in a row is pretty impressive. So this is the third in his trilogy, and it's called Black Panther's uh, Vanguard of the Revolution. So we're going to bring our seniors to that. And so a lot of the um, now comment articles that you've been posting are, are going to be relevant with us, and we'll be post, you know, writing about that, um, you know, in the next uh, little bit, um, you know, like in the next week because um, we'll see that movie on the 29th, so um, I want them to kind of be primed for that. So like I said, last year's crew, they graduated, but they saw this great thing, Freedom Summer, and this year they'll see Black Panther, so I feel like they probably need a little bit of uh, 
contextualization there, some context. And so um, I think now comment would be a good way to do that. Is I'm it's taking a long time to get to that point. But, you know, some of the articles you have are good, and then I'll post some things too. Um, it, but, you yeah, know, I mean, how to, how to yeah. facilitate that conversation is the question, I think. Well, I, your students got on to the um, some of the Paul Salafic stuff, right? Yeah, right. With my students. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was interesting. Yeah. And, and I don't. I haven't even looked at that very closely, but there was some interaction back and forth, and certainly it helped them be engaged and understand the text and so forth. I think. Yeah, so in a long answer to Dan's question, I see that's how um, we'll connect with uh, some of the things you've been posting, Paul. Yeah, I, and I'm hoping I'm hoping kids, you know, students start posting stuff too. So yeah, we'll see. Mm -hmm. As as it goes, I don't know. We have to keep thinking about. It. Al, welcome. Hey, glad to be here. Glad I made it. So we're doing we're doing a January kind of getting warmed up. But um, I, I, Chris Rogers pointed us to race forward um, and some of the models of of uh, thinking and learning and uh, doing media analysis that, that's represented there. And we're, we're right now thinking about reading together in some way. Um, what's okay. on your mind? Welcome. <laughs> um, I mean, just like overall, I guess, because I kind of checked out the website a little bit, the overall, you know, the whole aspect of, of race. And I, I think that they have, like, very positive ways of, of – I guess opening up the discussion. I just think overall, like, I guess talking about race and discussing race with with like groups of people is is kind of um you know I've I've, I've been to that rodeo like a couple different times in a couple different ways, especially like being like in and near Birmingham, you know, like that's kind of like like we get that whole race conversation to agnosium, and like overall one of the things that I kind of ha have discovered is that the people that get it get it. The people that don't, they don't get it, but they don't get it because they are a product of their experiences. And and I think that that's like a, a very overwhelming, you know, thing to kind of overcome because genuinely there's so many people that just don't know what they don't know. Like there is an entire world of consequences that just really don't exist in problematic levels. You know what I mean? Like they, I, I know on, on on that site, um, they were just talking about like the lack of discussion in the media of systemic racism, just for one example. Um, but the people that don't see it as a problem already are grown and adults and reasoning people that don't see it as a problem. You know what I mean? Like it's if if I think that there's just for example. Um, if I think that there's not a problem with, um, let's say, homelessness, right? Because in my neighborhood, in my experience, there's only one or two, and all of them are just, you know, college dropouts or high school dropouts or whatever. It's not really a, a epidemic problem. All of us don't need to really, like, you know, uh, get together to try to solve it. And that's kind of ultimately, like, what I think. You know what I mean? Like, how do you convince, uh, let's say, an entire police department that their practices are not right. Like, how do you do that? You know what I mean? Or how do you convince the entire school system that the entire system is anti-educating kids? Like, how do you do that? You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I don't... Mm -hmm. I, I, I draw blanks consistently. <laughs> Let me say that, you know? Yeah, I think, um, uh, Al, you bring up, like, a. Um, like, for example, um, like the, the night of the murders of the two officers in, in uh, New York City, immediately I went to Fox News because um, one of the things they talk about in the report is with how the media cover, how the media fails at covering race in its coded language, right? And if you can read the, like, if there's a printout, or it probably has to be somewhere, a transcript of Fox News, like, and we could use that annotation software and just go through. Um, like, for example, one of the things that um, I remember hearing at a bookstore was, in 1950s, you used to call people 
who would be who would can do racist acts, racist or bigots. But now in 2014, they're called like socially conservative, and this is just the conservative base. It, it is well, like I mean, whoa. <laughs> to me, kind of those little, but but the whole, and 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 I agree to to a point, but but like the danger of that is every social conservative isn't a racist, right? And 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 that's like the thing, like that's why the coded language works, right? You know what I mean? Because they have plausible deniability. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like you know, it's it's just not true in all all instances. It's 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 a very if you think about the founding of this country, like I'm just so happen to be studying the American Revolution right now, right? If you look at the founding of, of the country, with, with the fifth graders or fourth graders, fifth graders, yeah, fifth graders. Okay. But but when we study it, it, it's always very hard to convince them that these great men, right, not only owned slaves, uh, but at the same time was writing down words on pieces of paper. That is, like, writing down on a piece of paper, you, you're basically saying, I don't even consider people of color people. Like, teach that to a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. Like, you see what I mean? Like, so you grow up thinking, you know, the whole Columbus phenomenon. You know what I mean? Like, he discovered America. I mean, but it, it, it happens so often and, and is so a part of everything that makes us who we are. It's just like, I mean, how do you change that with a, with, you know, with a decent debate, <laughs> with a really good conversation? Yeah. And and I'm not saying, to me, that's the start of it, right? Like, I'm not disillusioned to think that in my lifetime, I'm ever going to see anything other than the effects of systemic racism. But I think a lot of the conversations that we have now, in 10 years, 50 years, 20 years, 100 years, or whatever it is, they're going to kind of be like, Hey, there was this Paul Allison that was having these conversations about blah 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 blah. You know what I mean? Like the same way we talk about, you know, Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael now. Like you can actually put it's weird because I had a conversation last week. I am having conversations with my son that my grandparents had with my parents when they were kids. Like what? Where they do that at? I mean, like, um, don't go to certain neighborhoods at night. Uh, talk to the police a certain way. Um, you know, uh, back then it was you had to know how to talk to white people. Like that was a thing. Like like code switching is real. There's there's a there's a certain diction that you're supposed to speak when you're interacting for job interviews or for you know in official capacities because you are marginalized to a certain level of intelligence if your subjects and verbs don't agree but if you really think about it I am a product of the slave trade which means I and my forefathers were taught to speak by the white people that owned us so however I talk is a result of that experience it's not just I decided to say it wrong you see what I mean? But none of that is considered when you see someone. We can look at the Trayvon Martin case when whoever he was talking to on the phone was on trial. I had I can't remember her name. Oh, yeah. But how was, she uh, talked was more important than what she was saying. And that's just a real thing, though. Like it's a real that's a real thing. Certain dialects yeah. are dumb dialects. Being called the Bama, you know, is a thing. Like it means something. <laughs> No, he's just Alabama, huh? I'm from Alabama. What are you saying, <laughs> right? So you know, I I don't I don't know how to um I don't know what the solutions are, but I think the problem ha is is a problem that that um is rooted in the very foundation of everything that makes our society go today. You know. So I just want to. Uh for the video, I like. I don't know if you heard that, Paul, but what he said, the idea of being a called a Bama, and then he, and then Al connected that with the legacy of slavery. That's immediately what the race forward thing is talking about. Of going just like that microaggression and how that connects back to hi history. Like even something as small as that is the exact uh, like teaching opportunity to remind folks of the. Uh, System that we're in, and the other thing I was going to say is, Al, y'all, uh, you remind me of um, interest, the interest convergence theory, which is part of like critical race theory. Derek Bell, who they, they accused of being like the radical professor because Obama right. took a class. 
Um, he says, it's a, uh, it's a quote that I use all the time. I think it's one of, uh, it's wonderful. He says, White, uh, whites cannot imagine the sacrifice and discipline necessary. I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I know I'm not going to get it exactly right. Whites cannot imagine the sacrifice and discipline necessary to be able to erase racism granted privileges. So there are opportunities in which there are um, sort of like appeasements. Um, one of those appeasements right now would be like Obama's community police initiative, and we're going to buy $265 million worth of cameras or whatever it is. And, but there are appeasements, and that is when it's in the mutual interest of whites and blacks. But for the most part, racism is still endemic as the um, order of today. But like to me, like and and, and kind of just keeping with that, and then and then I want to listen because I know I got in late and I want to hear what y'all were talking about a little bit. But I, I asked somebody a question last week. I said, let's let's start from today, right? Let's let's come up with this little real short hypothetical. What if everybody that's white was captured today and taken to a country where they didn't know the language and they were enslaved for four hundred years, and then when they were not slaves, they were made second class citizens. For another 150 years, the question that I'll ask after that is, how long do you think it would take for that race of people to be equal with the oppressing race of people? And it ain't probably 50 years. Like, it's not the amount of time that happens. So if you just think about now moving forward, it would be incredible to think that it could even possibly be fair now. You know what I mean? Like... You've done this to people for over 500 years, marginalized them, treated them wrong, made it illegal to educate them, and now, well, you got a black president, so it must be fair. It's ludicrous to think of that way. But that's exactly how it is thought about. You know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, well, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. So, Al, I, I haven't known you long, but you seem... Uh I don't know, more energetic around these issues than you have been. <laughs> or at Let, me least tell you what happened. Yeah. Let me tell you what happened, though, because like, it, it, actually, it actually affected me in a more personal way over the past year. Uh, short story long, I have a history of teaching mathematics. I didn't really know how good of a math teacher I was. I'm just being honest. I just Because my first year teaching math, I was taught how to teach math, by a guy named Robert Moses. I had no idea who Robert Moses was, like in my life. I signed up for this program called the Algebra Project because he said, hey, you can make some extra money in the summer. Now, after I did this for like six or seven years, and, and I wasn't doing the Algebra Project anymore, and I got involved with other programs, and then I heard, you know, like President Clinton saying, we need a Robert Moses effect uh, to do this approach to solve this problem. Well, I started reading these books, Radical Equation by Robert Moses. I'm like, this is the guy blah 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 so then I applied to be a math coach in my school system and I didn't get the job well just because I didn't get the job doesn't mean it's because I was black now there are other nuances with the details one of the nuances was the uh, director of mathematics in my school system has never taught math before in her life that's one two the person that got hired was her son-in-law to be the math coach that's two so at why? So in the paper it was written about as nepotism, right? Now now mind you, I have a key to the city of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, because of a summer math program that we that we taught. Uh, I was one of 16 teachers in the state of Alabama that was selected to participate in the Noise program um, to to teach math. I, I mean like all of this stuff, math, 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 math right? This son-in-law was like this is like his third year teaching ever. Right now, after the nepotism case, they said, "Well, you can't be the math coach." They hired someone else. They, I didn't even know they was gonna hire somebody else. I didn't get the job. Then they gave it to this other girl who's been teaching. Like, I mean, not even in the state. Right, hired from Florida. That was one. Then I applied to be a technology coach. Right, didn't get that job. Similar scenarios, whatever, whatever, and. The people that they hired would come to my class on break so I can teach them how to do something like a hangout so they could do a hangout for the technology team. <laughs> so what, what, what I'm saying is I'm not saying that's racism. I'm saying it's favoritism of a group of people that happen to all be the same. 
I say it's racism. Race. How, I can you... see how an institute, but how an institution or how a pattern, right, but, of 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 certain types of favoritism benefits, and then you, you, it it just start to become more apparent. Like it struck me personally, and then I would start to see things that were a little bit more overt. That I, I don't know if I was ignoring or I was just thought, well, you know, it's dead, it's gone, or it's not here, or whatever. And it, it's 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 just kind of like, you know what, it is what it is. So you know, so it just kind of like hits. It kind of hits a nerve with me differently now. <laughs> What's the hit? It's quite a story. <laughs> yeah. And the worst but, part of that. Oh, I was gonna say the worst part of that too is I don't think people understand that we have to live with that burden of like, is it about race? Is it not about race? But right. you have to like, and people don't even. It's like, oh no, it's not about race. It's the fact that I gotta live with the burden of thinking whether it's this has nothing to do with my ability as a person. Right. And 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 that's kind of my thing. It, it's not whether it was race, regardless of what it was. Here's what I know: it wasn't. It wasn't trying to hire the best qualified person for a position. Exactly. So that's kind of just not fair. You know what I mean? Now, listen, I've been in the classroom 18 years. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm a dissertation away from a doctorate, two degrees, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, it's just kind of weird to, you know, want to be a something. You know, I wasn't trying to, you know, rock a boat or anything. But the people that were making these decisions are making decisions based on relationships. Like I know this person, or um, or whatever, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't think it can be considered "quote unquote" racism because I don't think they're like we're not giving them you you this job because you're black, right? And and I think that's kind of the caveat. That's 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 how it's able to exist and not be talked about in in terms of racism. Because it's it's so like deniable, you know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? Some of my best friends are black. Like, what do you mean? Right? right? Like, literally. So, you know, I just get a little excited uh, yeah. because I've, I've outside of here, I've talked about certain things to Ignazium, and I've been going over certain ideas because I'm writing a book. So I'm having to kind of think about how to articulate. Right. What's going on in, in in a more real sense? So me working on the book, me having certain experiences, and you know, I don't know. I guess I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm glad you get old. That's a good thing. See, I, I'm trying to think about that. Uh, you know, we're here talking about Black Lives Matter, and there's a protest movement out there, and we're thinking about how this fits into our curriculum um, and you're telling these stories and I think that is what this is about in some way and I don't know how to articulate this terribly but it's it's something about the indignities the unfairness that you just described and then you know Michael Brown happens too and Eric Garden, Gardner ha right. happens too and 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 it's that connection that's that I think is really obvious to you and isn't obvious to many of us. And I, I mean, but yeah, like not not really to cut you off, but then it'll be like, okay, I I am really a nerd. Like I, I can remember walking to the library, checking out books in the summer to figure out how to write programs to use this computer that our uncle gave us. Like I go way back, ten list, if this, then that, da 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 da, run program, find the bug. That's kind of how I got into computers. Like I I'm, I am that nerd. So I'm doing all these little technology things or whatever in my classroom, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, and I did not get the technology coach job, and I'm not bitter. And that's the thing. Listen. The guy cool. that got the job, he's a great guy. I love him, and I help him, and and so it's nothing, no <laughs> negative, no seriously, sincerely, no, okay. whatever. But well, but I, I think like, your fifth graders are happy you're there. But go ahead. Oh man, I love him, I love him. But like I submitted something to ISTE, and I'll be presenting in Philadelphia this summer of you know this little program that I you know with this little operation to do in the classroom with technology or whatever, and it's weird because out. It becomes more apparent because outside of where I work, it's like people are like, oh man, you could do this, come and show us like this. It, you know what I mean? 
I'll I'll try to do a presentation at, at, at my school system, and 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 magically I'm the only person that doesn't have a room when it's time to present at Ed Camp or something weird. You see what I mean? It'll be like, hmm, that's odd. You know what I mean? Like it, it it'll just be like, wow, that's that's so coincidental that I don't, you know, I can't do this or you know, I, I mean, it'll it'll just be weird little coincidences. But then once you leave where you are. And, and you're respected for what you know and what you're able to present, it makes it more difficult to come back and, and even deal with, like, people that just don't get it. Like, my, my it's not a New Year's resolution, but after all that happened with the whole job or whatever, I kind of decided that instead of trying to convince people to think like me, it was just easier to find people that already did. You know what I mean? And and, and the people that get on board, let's, let's keep moving forward with them. Because the people that don't know what it is, don't know what it is. They just, they don't know. <laughs> All right, Other, others want to jump in? Thoughts, questions? <laughs> I was going to say, it reminds me of my favorite uh, <laughs> quote. You know, uh, racism is the reasons in the doubt. They say reasonable doubt. And you'd be like, race is the reason, <laughs> doubt. What's, what's reasonable? You know, and racism is the thing that becomes a reasonable in some like weird, you know what I'm saying, um, irrational thing. So can can I? Um, I'm going to. I Selma, has anybody seen it yet? Are you going to go see it? Um, can that be part of this conversation? How might we move move that movie into you know this larger race forward Black Lives Matter conversation? I made some assumptions there, but yeah. I want to go see yeah, it. I mean, but yeah. Okay. What? I want to ask Al, how big is it in the? Uh, you're in Alabama, right? Yeah. So. <sighs> yes and no. So okay. I, Al, my when when my wife and I, my wife said to me when she left, she said because uh, she loves Robert Moses, she said, "Where was Robert Moses in that movie?" But just to say, <laughs> can't, can't have yeah, yeah. everybody. Yeah, I know. Can't have everybody. Can't can't have everybody. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's big and it's not big. Like, okay, think of it this way: there's not a movie theater in Selma, mm -hmm. so they they can't see it in Selma. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, what are you talking about, right? There's not a movie theater in Selma. That's a friend of mine. She's a lawyer down there, and she was like, she was trying to organize a viewing of some sort where maybe they can show it at a a school or whatever, just so the people of Selma can see the movie. But so I think that might it, be happening. But yeah, yeah, I, I I think it is. But there's not. It's not like on a regular day they can go to the movie theater. When they had the early release of it, like I was expecting to be able to see it on Christmas because they had an early release in select cities. Well, Birmingham wasn't one of those select cities, which was odd to me. It seemed like it, it seems like the the boots on the ground in Birmingham did not seize whatever opportunities there were. I can't imagine. If anybody of any importance requested that movie to be shown in Birmingham as one of the cities, it would not have been. So I just think it was one of those, you know, somebody didn't ask, some didn't follow through. But I, it, it's a big deal of people that I talk to. Like I don't know anybody that doesn't want to see it, mm -hmm. um, so, you know. But then I don't know everybody. <laughs> so I, and and part of I do. Where was it gonna? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, I, I wanted to mention uh, what you just said um, on, on the other side of that, that uh, I don't know if you noticed, but New York City 7th, 8th, and 9th graders, anybody who's a 7th, 8th, or 9th grader can go see the movie for free, which is wow. kind of fun. They raise money That's for cool. that. They show their ID or their report card, and they get in. That's cool. <laughs> which I think yeah. it's but then, and then, and then getting back to Dan and Mel comment, um, so uh, what I've been collecting together and would love for others to collect uh, with us um, in some way is um, kind of reviews looking at the movie from both historical and, you know, the, some of the controversies I think are important around the historical aspects of the film. Um, Maybe, maybe not, you know, but I, but there's, there's, you know, there's some of that in there that I think kids would be interested in. Um, getting into the Voting Rights Act is a big deal, you know, if we can do that in some way, I think that would be a good thing, 
good way to go. Certainly connecting us up to Ferguson and, and say, you know, is this similar, different, what's similar, what's not similar, and, you know, plenty of people have talked about that, too. Um, and then I mentioned in, in my notes about this show here tonight, um, oh, what's his name? <laughs> uh, but, anyway, but, but the idea that, that Ferguson and Selma and, and, other pro and the protests that are going on right now are not necessarily, he said, are not necessarily fireworks, but to look for the pilot light that's kind of burning beneath all of that um, is, is worth doing. So I just wanted to know if this makes sense. Does, uh, you know, are your kids going to see it? Are you going to see it with them? Are you going to try to integrate this into your curriculum? Does, you know, what are you thinking about? Well, uh, like I said, you know, we're we're watching we're gonna watch a different movie, so I think there's some interesting convergence uh, that'll happen there because you know, um, Black Panther, uh, you know, obviously a lot of protest about things, systemic things, and so um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have plans to have my class watch that movie, but we're watching the other movie. So, do you think they'll see it anyhow? That's a good question. I. Um, I've been thinking about how to uh, get them to see that. Mm. I mean, we read, you know, like coming up is a uh, letter from Birmingham Jail, which is just like a classic in my class. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's obviously a, a kind of a tie-in for me there. I don't want anybody thinking, though, that uh, I remember when like 12 Years a Slave came out, and it was like, oh, man, you got to go see this movie. And it's like, I don't want people um, thinking that you can substitute watching this movie and like paying your $8 to go see this movie as a substitute for the real race conversation that needs to be had in this country. It's almost like, go to see the movie, but more importantly, discuss the movie afterwards. And that's, that's where the real work is. Um, so, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm down for. I'm more instead, like you were saying, like the reviews and seeing what people thought and um, having those conversations because I don't want to get it if people thinking that like oh yeah you did a movie you conquered racism in America today uh, you just hmm. get off a movie ticket but that kind of goes back to the now comment and how to make that kind of work right uh, you know so like when my kids make a comment uh, Dan this is kind of a question but um, they they're notified when someone comments back or Right, because that seems to be the if real click, key. If with you this. click it on, and there's a in the upper right hand corner, there's a place to click that on and off. And yeah. the default is off, but yeah, is that right? I think that's right. Well, you, um, you the the notifications are pretty granular, so you can the the default that people get is like once a day, because at, at the college level, you know, if there's a lot of discussion going on. You know, people were, were feeling like they're getting emails, you know, every few minutes all through the day. So the, the default is, is a batch is a once a day in a digest email. But what I prefer personally is to get them, like, instantly as they come. So if you, there's a notifications, um, you know, on the menu where, like, your account and it's, like, where you log out and stuff, upper right-hand corner, you pull that, uh, you pull it down the little triangle by your name and it has a notifications preferences and you can specify I want to be notified if someone replies to me I want to be notified if someone comments on a thread that I'm involved in so you have a lot of choices and then you can also choose whether you want a once a day or some or the immediate you know send me an email right away so so each, each student could choose how they wanted to do it I yeah, and and just to say, Chris, when you said your articles a little while ago, I I like felt funny about that because, and, and I get that, but how do we make, how do we like decide upon something? Well, let me just ask you, you know, if you find something that will do what Chris you just said. Uh, Chris Rogers just said, like, what will lead out of the movie into these bigger discussions that we're having already around, you know, Ferguson and, and Black Lives Matter and, and so forth. Um, so, 
I think we need to agree upon a text that will help us do that and or help students help us find that text. So, you know, I have a bunch of nominations that I'll that I'll put a link up on Youth Voices. I haven't done it yet, but we'll do. Um, could I could I jump in with a couple yeah. of just sure. conceptual questions? Um, mm -hmm. Just to, in this group, um, I guess Al has fifth graders, and and Paul, you've got middle schoolers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Chris is seniors in in high school. So and is some the younger ones too, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. ten through twelve. Mm. Oh, ten through twelve. Okay, okay. So I was just curious, and, and I know there are lots of other teachers and communities in the Youth Voices program. So is there an effort to to have the students who are at the similar grade levels necessarily connect with each other, being on the same experiential or intellectual level, or is it a more free-for-all kind of a thing? Well, I think it's more like who's there, uh, who's actually talking, and a lot of times it's Paul students. So what happens when we uh, enter into discussions like with Paul students is I think of it more like a one-room schoolhouse so we'll say, oh, I'll say to them, oh, you know, these students are like middle school students in New York. And, and sometimes, you know, like having a little bit of background about who's writing the comments mm -hmm. makes a pretty big difference. And so, yeah, sure. I think it's more like who's game for actually being there and talking rather than me trying to find another, you know, 12th grade class or something. Gotcha. Well, let me, so that, that was one question I had. The other Another aspect of it is, you know, now comment isn't isn't so much like a a real time kind of a con for the people who haven't used it. Um, it's not a real time thing. So the idea would be, say, like you you guys could, if you wanted to, come up with some some kind of structure or context. Say, like Paul's group makes a first pass and they they make a commenting pass. And then another, there's sort of a handoff, and some other kids resp respond, or you know, or just, or after someone primes the pump, then everyone can jump in at that point. But there, there may be some um, some techniques that would make it easier for the other kids to get into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, and, and I'm also thinking that that issue that came up quite a while ago now about like looking at details. And then moving back to the more systemic structural issues, um, you know, maybe the tool is great for those details. And what you just said, if if we have time and patience to do a second run through, but it would be great. We've said this before, but it'd be great to read an article together first there on that comment, and then have a conversation like this, right, um, where we're or in class. So that, and that's a way to kind of get to the bigger issues, I think. Um, going forward a little bit, and not to use that word again, um, we Chris and Chris uh, Rogers and I are going to pursue race forward, folks. So there are a lot of amazing people there, um, and we're going to kind of invite them here onto the show and kind of figure things out a little bit. Um, so that's one thing. Any other thoughts that anybody wants to kind of suggest how we can keep this? conversation going. Others have said, but I'll say also, you know, when Ferguson happened in August, people were saying, oh, is it going to be a one-week thing, or what's it going to be? It's obvious that this is uh, going to be percolating and, and moving for some time. So, anyway, just to I, I would also, that. like, suggest, and I know just for, like, me, and, like, over Christmas break, I kind of unplugged a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, just... And, and, and I guess with the whole race issue, for you, to me, you can't beat a dead horse because that you know this horse won't die. But um, I think like I have to work that through. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But 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 also I think that it's important to to acknowledge that like sometimes when we talk about other things and race come up, just let it come up as mm -hmm. opposed to we're talking about race. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times, you know, like I almost can't think of a scenario where if you're talking about a problem, race at some level isn't contributing. And I think that's a more powerful way 
to talk about the race conversation. You know, like if we talk about problems in education, then you're really going to be talking about instances of poverty, and then you're going to be talking about a lineage of advantages and disadvantages of certain groups, which ultimately in this country is going to go back to, you know, Oh, who was getting how come there aren't any black farmers? Well, because they were giving land away, they weren't giving land away to us. But when they first started giving out, you know, subsidized home loans, well, it wasn't a lot of subsidized home loans going to black people, so they didn't have those properties to pass down. So regardless of what you're talking about in this country, if it's a problem, chances are somewhere in the wings has something to do with black people being you know, never really granted sovereignty. You know, slavery ended and you still wasn't a citizen. Sorry. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I can't imagine not being able to read or write, not owning anything, and someone taking chains off my ankles and feet after I've been in this country four generations from Africa and somebody saying, you're free. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's an interesting, I actually got a book. Ah, I don't can remember the name of it. It's a thin book, but the book were interviews that they did with freed slaves, right? Like actual slaves that were free. And many of them didn't like it. Like they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. They didn't know how to, you know, interact in this world. Like it was kind of like, listen, I just really want to get on a better plantation. You know, Master Johnson give his slaves Christmas off or whatever. I mean, it was it was just so interesting to see their perspective. It wasn't this freedom, like we think of it as freedom, like they were free to do what? They were free to be lynched, or they were free to not be able to vote, or free to not go to school, or free to be a sharecropper, which is oddly similar to slavery, or, you know, free to be captured for no reason and made to work in a chain gang, which was a lot like slavery. So is 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 I think it will be important to not over talk about race, but anytime is brought up to not dismiss it as if that's not what we're talking about, if that makes sense. I don't think you could be more clear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anybody else have any final thoughts? <laughs> we could leave that as our final <laughs> yeah, thoughts. Right? <laughs> I think I'm good with that. <laughs> Everybody, thank you for joining us, and thank you for keeping the conversation going. Um, we do it here every Wednesday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time, and um, please come back. Um, we, uh, as always, thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, who founded this thing called edtechtalk.com uh, with the World Bridges Network. Thank you all, and good evening. Nice. Glad I made it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Peace.